Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming out to see this talk on queerness, a uh, global post-colonial perspective. Before we start with the talk itself, I would like to invite you to check in on yourself, see if you're sitting well, if your breathing is OK. And during the talk, I will do this every once in a while, because colonialism, gender binary, racism has inscribed in our bodies too. And one way to endure and to struggle for a long time has to be a good relationship to our bodies. So I would like to invite you to take a breath, see how you're sitting right now. OK, for me, it's, I'm Kuso. I do work at different institutions of anti-racism as a freelance person as well. And mainly, I do I think I'm sitting here because I did a podcast with Shinan on the intersections of gender identity and uh, race, more especially from German Asian perspectives um, for a couple of years. So uh, I'm very honored to sit here and facilitate this talk, or rather now because it's a hybrid talk, we, I will not only facilitate, but also be in conversation and share this conversation with Lilith with inputs from Silesh and Jin that I will uh, introduce later on. So thank you, Dear White People Festival Organization and also Theater Freiburg for uh, hosting us. Lilith, Hello, uh, to start into our conversation, we're talking here um, exactly five years after the murders of the Pulse Club in Orlando where 49 people lost their lives and it left 53 people injured. And um, would like to invite everybody to just think about that um, being in memory about lives that are being lost, um, fellow queer folks. Actually, because before I come to you, I would like to frame this a little bit more, I think. Um, Judith Butler reminds us, a queer theorician, that queerness, uh, that heteronormativity is forced and when we look at Fausto Sterling's text, and Fausto Sterling teaches us that even on this biological aspect of what is called sex, it's actually upheld. The gender binary has to be upheld by massive sanctions by the state um, and politics of enforcing this gender binary, which in reality doesn't exist as a essence, but is a social construct and a colonial construct. Because right here from Germany in the 20th century, uh, Friedrich von Kraft Ebbing uh, wrote that the distinction between men and women, that you can read them as men and women very clearly, is a sign of civilization. All other people, all other peoples in the, on this planet, especially the colonial ones, didn't have that as much, and the gender binary as the same kind of construct, so they were too colonized, to brutalize, to exploit it for their workforce. Um, this is also Pride Month, it's June, and I would like to frame this, this as well as a month to remember not only, but also especially Marsha P. Johnson, a black trans woman, sex worker, and her fellow activist, Sylvia Rivera, a Latinx person, activist, also trans person, sex worker, who not only started the riots on Christopher Street, who also, in their political praxis, enforced shelters, the first shelters for queer people that were existing, and for so on, reimagined society in a way of what really makes us safe, what do we need to care for each other, and how can we live in a world not sanctioned by the state and by the police. So queer tactics and queer life, especially trans queer lives, are always uh, exa an example of abolitionist practice, as we will hear later on as well from Jin Harita Warren. 
to come to you, Lilith, would you please like to introduce yourself, how you got here to be with me in conversation in this moment, and the work you're doing? Uh, thank you. Uh, I hope everybody can listen. Uh, thank you for coming here. Uh, thank you also, the team of Dear White People, for inviting us and also the theater to give us space to talk about the issues that we will share today. Uh, my name is Lilit uh, Raza, and I am from, uh, originally from Pakistan. It's been almost a decade that I'm living in Germany and working for the rights of uh, queer migrants and refugees, especially those who apply for asylum in Germany and uh, face a lot of uh, issues during their asylum processes from uh, being neglected uh, as uh, queer persons to uh, not uh, getting the same rights as the non-migrant and non-asylum seeker uh, queer people in Germany. Yeah, and um, uh, with Kuzo, we had a chat uh, last year as well on a podium in Cologne for Hochschule. And, uh, I have heard about you a lot even before uh, we met uh, from a couple of other friends. And today uh, we were being asked to talk about the uh, colonial perspective of queerness and I will talk mostly about the South Asian perspective and also the perspectives, perspectives that we have within Cologne and in Germany uh, generally. So it's been um, four years I'm working for the Queer Refugees Deutschland project, which is from Lesbian and Gay Federation Germany, in Germany. And uh, we are trying our best to make the lives of queer migrants and asylum seekers better. And uh, my role is there to uh, help the people to change the policies, because that's where the actual problem starts within the uh, within the structural racism and the structural discrimination of queer people. And up till now, we have been able to do that a lot, uh, but it's still not enough. Uh, if you see it from a South Asian perspective, I'm like, okay, you don't have to control everything that we have. Uh, let us be. Yeah. Thank you so much. The uh, work you're doing is really at the intersections of deprivileged people when it comes to passport, nationality, also when it comes to class, and when it comes to, of course, gender identity, sexuality, and, and race. So really at the, um, where a focus needs to be if we want, if we're talking queer liberation, if we're talking re uh, liberation from oppression in general, economic oppression. And I would like to ask you too, what do you think about 2021, we're in this moment right now, after all the protests from last year, um, what, how do you think about what point are we at in Germany right now when it comes to the rights and to centering these perspectives? So um, Germany, in my view, the biggest issue uh, is the federalism here because there is nothing central. Sometimes being central is also important uh, that you have uh, uh, the same rights and almost the same issues everywhere. But in Germany, it's not the case. It's like every single state has their own different issues. And we have been protesting about the rights of people to leave the state if they have to, to go to another state and live there so that they could be more in security and safety. Because there are certain states where we also know there is a lot of uh, racism, then there is a lot of uh, uh, transfeindlichkeit, homofeindlichkeit coming from other uh, groups as well, uh, like on the right-wingers. And that uh, adds to the misery. And that's where the, uh, the states say, no, you have to stay in our state for three years. There's a von sitz auflage pflicht, they call it. It's a very beautiful word. Um, so you are confined. So your body is still confined to a space where you don't want to, but you have to because it's uh, embedded within the structural discrimination of people who do not have a German passport. 
So if you have a German passport, you can move around freely everywhere within Germany and also within EU. But being a refugee and asylum seeker especially, that's not your privilege. But still we say that uh, the government says or the uh, representatives of the government, yeah, we all have the same rights here in Germany. Um, not really. Um, then I would also like to talk about one more thing uh, which people always forget and I have to face that in my work every now and then whenever I do the sensitization workshops with people, especially cis hetero people. Yeah, now you people can get married. What else do you want? And I'm like, um, that's the first step actually. <laughs> because you have been marrying each other for the last uh, 2000 years and nobody was questioning that. And now all of a sudden we can just marry, you are questioning why are we asking for other rights? And in, even in there, so if somebody has a German passport and the other person does not have a German passport, the marriage is not equal. It's unequal. And if two people with non-German passports want to marry in Germany, having also the right to live in Germany, that's also very tricky here. Honestly speaking, it takes a lot of paperwork, go to your embassies, tell them, and even embassies ask you, okay, so you're getting married, with whom are you getting married? Tell us about it. So the structure asks you, the system asks you to out yourself everywhere, be vulnerable, get discrimination, and then you will get your rights. So you are pushed to the limits. And those limits are seen from, as you told us before, from a very binary perspective. Ah, oh, okay, two people want to get married. We need to know who uh, they are, what are their genders, how they're going to get married. And all these embassies, um, I can talk about Pakistan, um, they still treat us as if we are the colonized ones and they are our colonizers. The system is still colonizing us. They still want two witnesses from I don't know where to give us a testimony. The Germans are not asked about uh, testimonies and witnesses from fellow German citizens. They're not. But we are still treated by our own very governments like that way because it was our colonial masters who used to treat us that way. In this case, they were the British, and they have made us look like as we were not civilized. When they came to us, we were already civilized. We had our own regional laws. We were quite queer. I wouldn't say we were having same-sex marriages uh, the way Germany is having it now, but people were not asking us about our queerness. They were not checking what was between our legs. They were not asking us to identify ourselves with a certain gender. They were not asking us to be conforming a specific um, a norm that how a man should look like, how a woman should look like. So ethnically, I am a Punjabi. And in my culture, men and women used to wear the same colors. It was OK. Men and women both used to wear jewelry, lots of it, actually. They would also wear kajal, uh, this kajal in the eyes. And what not, very beautiful dresses. And nobody was questioning the masculinity. That's what we were also talking in the morning today. The colonizers have also put very hard and fast rules how a male body should look like, what should it put on uh, as clothes or as ornaments, and how a female body should look like, and what should they wear on their bodies. That was not the case, at least in my region, in my part of the world. Yeah, and coming back to your question, sorry, it's been a, a bit more that I'm talking a lot. Uh, I think in Germany, we need to look at a brighter and a broader perspective that all these things, all these policies coming from the top, which are still regulating our, our bodies, people don't take it that way. 
um, they are there to keep a check and balance. They are not there to assist you. I don't, I see it very differently. Um, of course, I am in the system, I'm working with the system as well, but I personally see there is a lot of things that the people need to learn more about the, uh, their own history. Let's go back to before um, Christianity came to this part of the world. I'm definitely sure there were people having orgies without asking what's between your legs. I'm definitely sure there were a lot of trans persons, queer gender persons, and I am definitely sure about that there were a lot of people who were just queer and there and living their lives. It's the Christianity that told us there are witches. If a woman knows more than a man, she's a witch. That's also, that's also something that came with the, with the religion and with this patriarchal religion mindset that we have to control the bodies. We have to control the sex. Um, it's a holy matrimony. Um, yeah, I'm happy that's not the case in Islam at least. <laughs> it's not a holy matrimony, it's still a contract between two pe uh, persons. And the sex, to regulate that, and even in today's world it's being regulated, uh, women bodies are being regulated, queer bodies are being regulated. They can give birth or not. Should they give birth or not? And even in Germany till 20, uh, 2012, trans persons were either sterilized or they had to go through castration to get their identities, which was once again a check and balance on their bodies. Like, this is how we want you to appear. If you are not going to appear like this, if you're not going to have the genitals between your legs, you do not, con you are not considered of this gender. And all the protests that we are doing, I think we need to change the protest to a different uh, way. Maybe the hippie world has to come back again, where everybody is a person, an individual, and regardless of their sex, gender, and whatever uh, defines them in the eyes of the general public. So just forget about it. Thank you for this powerful message, or these messages, because you were talking about confined bodies, about sa state-sanctioned violence against bodies, and you talked about the link to colonialism, and I think this is a theme that will come over and over when we hear the inputs from the video as well, that its own queer liberation always has to include decolonization because, and this is not as a metaphor of like um, some symbolism, but it's material decolonization that we need for queer liberation as uh, you just mentioned uh, indirectly a few times and, and Jin and Silesh and the interview partner of Silesh will uh, talk and I think Maybe now it's a good part to hear Jin's uh, video for now because uh, I think it suits this uh, conversation quite well. Uh, I wanted to remind everybody, or myself as well, that uh, challenging the gender binary makes us think about and being able to think about also challenging the very base of our society because it needs a radical reimagination of what we think is normal and therefore we could also challenge state sanctioned violence and challenge the concept of police and what makes us safe in general as uh, Angela David Davis put, put, put it um, last August. So a uh, short introduction for Jin Harita Warren, who unfortunately cannot be here with us physically today, but provided us with a lot of food for thought and a uh, new point where we can start, where we can pick up this conversation again. Jin Harita Warren is an associate professor of gender, race, and environment at York University. Having grown up in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s, in Germany, their activist scholarship began on queer of color kitchen tables in London and Berlin. In the early 2010s, they moved to Turtle Island, where they live on the lands of the Mississaugas of New Credit First Nation, the Huronwendat First Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Metis Nation of Ontario. 
Jin's publications include two books, including Queer Lovers and Hateful Others and The Biopolitics of Mixing, numerous articles, including NGLQ and Sexualities, and several co-edited collections, including Queer Necropolitics, Queering Urban Justice, Marvelous Grounds, and a special issue on polyamory. German language texts include, uh, include chapters like Queer, Queer Imperialismus, Kissens and Drag Queens, Sexuelle Spektakel von Kiez und Nation, und über die Unmöglichkeit, die Beziehung zwischen Kolonialität, Urbanität und Sexualität zu thematisieren. Dr. Harita Warren has made forerunning contributions to German and transnational debates on homonationalism, gay imperialism, queer space, neoliberal cities, police violence and abolition, and trans and queer color theories and politics. So I would like to introduce this video, this part of the video uh, Jen provided for us, and we'll frame it a little bit afterwards. So I now want to bring into conversation other queer of color artists and activists um, to argue that the dystopic space we're in nevertheless births new possibilities for existing with each other. So we're back on the intersection of COVID and futurity. I want, um, sorry, Octavia Butler, yes. Many are rediscovering the speculative landscapes of Octavia Butler, whose parable of the sower is set in a 2020s not unlike our own. One that is marred by fascist government, environmental breakdown and abandonment. The novel summons the potential for change, a change that is spiritual, and recited as a recurring prayer by its heroine, a multiracial black woman and her pod of outcasts who are literally reaching for the stars. There is a long line of writers like Butler who have encouraged us to turn to the fantastical in order to shed the forms that have never served us and create space for the purposeful dreaming it will take to escape the intoler intolerable present. In taking this current leap, we invite possession by feisty queer elders and ancestors who broke with normality and chose pleasure and connection over isolation and social death. We remember lessons from the AIDS crisis, that safer socialities are attractive and fun, and that fluid bonded pods are part of a heritage that can comfort us in the face of collective trauma and devastation. In this legacy, we reclaim quarantining as a methodology of not just survival, but of care and connection, of sexiness even. I want to suggest that queer performances of quarantine can be abolitionist methodologies in that they divest from a necropolitical state-led par paradigm of surveillance that repeats and reproduces racism and replace it with an alternative horizon that foregrounds other logics, rehearses other skills and values, and orients itself to other pasts and futures. There's a lot of intersecting legacies that are being forged right now that deserve attention, like the Oglala and Cheyenne River Sioux nations putting up checkpoints to defend their peoples and territories from COVID and from a state that's always been willing to sacrifice and extract them for economic interests and really enacting quarantine as sovereignty this way. Here, I want to lift up queer masks, pods, and bubbles, and care collectives as alternatives to state-led lockdown that enact transformative justice and prefigure the world we want to live in. Our pods and bubbles are subversive methods of quarantine that do not stem from the maternalism of an Angela Merkel or a Jacinda Ardern, whose appropriation of these languages into policy unsurprisingly completely erases the queer int intimacies that event invented them. They step into long legacies of mutual aid created by black, indigenous and people of color on all intersections who have looked after each other while the state was nowhere to be found, at least not in a supportive function. Their, role, their real role model is the disability justice activism of disabled queers of color, like the famous 2016 pod mapping worksheet 
by Mia Mingus, Mingus of the Bay Area Transformative Justice Project and the Power to Live Project laid by Stacey Park Milder, Milburn to keep other disabled people alive during the wildfires in California. Stacey taught us. She recently passed away and is mourned by many. The pots and bubbles that are being formed in response to COVID invent intimacy beyond conservative lines of blood, marriage, privatized driveways, and the law. They keep people alive, but more than that, they practice relationships grounded in honesty, communication, and consent, where we learn and teach conflict resolution and consensus making skills. They are abolitionist in that they create alternatives to the police and rehearse transformative justice, safety, and accountability outside of the system. They are also visionary. Far from frozen, our pods and bubbles are alive and bristling with growth and transformation. They are cocoons that incubate new worlds. And hi, MZ, whose name I also spotted on this call. Our masks to explode the meanings assigned by the state from the arrogant Eurocentrism of the early days when masks were an Asian thing that didn't work and wasn't needed, including by those whose conditions of working and living in hospitals and other workplaces declared essential in prisons on reservations, render PPE, personal protective equipment, crucial. To the later discovery of masks as the sometimes only solution for reinstating normality and making us return to market. This is some artwork that MZ does that you can check out on, on, the, on this Instagram. This 180 degree turnaround happened in the midst of a raging pandemic that is a matter of life and death, especially for disabled BIPOC and FEMS. Popping out of this dehumanizing mold and spilling over from it, cutie BIPOC masks are defiant fashion symbols of cultural pride, unruly gender identities, of diasporic attachment, of survivor genius. The spaces that our masks help, um, make help us map and adorn the spaces that they help us map and adorn go beyond physical distancing and self-preservation. They are expansive, expressive, joyful. They are also re relational. They make room for others. From those who need professionally made masks more urgent urgently, to those whom our masks protect from our exhalations thus helping us tread softly and unlearn capitalistic self-interest. From the people making masks, and by extension, every being, human and or more, involved in growing, fertilizing, picking, processing, delivering, everything that feeds, clothes, transports, and shelters us. To those with whom we're resisting, and in solidarity. From the ones willing to mirror us, whose senses come alive with the bright, fabulous, often clashing, always weird textures, colors, shapes, and patterns that we messily recombine, breaking the rules of aesthetics, of common sense, of white, het uh, white cis heteropatriarchy, of normal, see, I can't even say it, of queer performers as queer performers always have done. To the ancestors and chosen family who are waiting to be interwoven and rehomed into genealogies and diasporic collectivities that are big enough for all. And I just want to shout out everyone who's shared pictures of their masks. I think Karen and Sand are here as well and what they mean to them. I'm hoping to spend more time with you all so I can reciprocate your gifts of words and image.
Our masks then rehearse care in a world whose inhabitants have forgotten how to look after themselves, let alone each other. They foster connection rather than punishment and isolation, reciprocity rather than selfishness, consensus rather than top-down rule. They are acts of what Adrienne Marie Brown calls pleasure activism, in that they energize us and help us express who we are, who we want to be and be in relationship with. They let us tap into vitality in a death dealing world and grow desires that can propel us elsewhere. As we reject old and new versions of the normal, we still seize the moment to norm. This round of revolution does not just break with the past and remake the future from nothing. It embraces possibilities that are already livable in the here and now and have long been rehearsed. It pays gratitude to all the moving movement spaces, including the ones that were never archived, enumerated or officially engaged. The kitchen table, the street corner, the care collective, the community acupuncture clinic. And I want to end by complicating the organic in this list and in the organic intellectualism that we held up in, in the earlier books that I've mentioned, both Queer Lovers and Hateful Others, and the co-authored Marvelous Grounds and its sister volume, Queering Urban Justice, also with Raida Musa and Cyrus Marcus Ware. In addition to the offline connectivities that we celebrated there, I really want to acknowledge also the power of digital spaces, with, which have gotten a bit of a bad rep recently, for understandable reasons. Facebook, right? Um, certainly the digital environments that absorb more and more of our waking energies, especially during quarantine times, are full of violence. And definitely most of us can't wait to hug again. But these digital spaces are also populated, populated by repertoires that rehearse other worlds, by visions of uprising, by acts of solidarity that model possibilities beyond the anti-blackness that has infected non-black communities. Like the owners of the Gandhi Mahal restaurant in Minneapolis damaged during the uprising, whose Facebook post affirmed that Black Lives Matter by any means necessary and went viral. And the K-pop fans breaking Dallas Police Department snitching app with fan cam shots of Korean pop stars, the TikTok users emptying out Trump's Tulsa rally with fake seat reservations, and the on and offline mutual aid groups that I've mentioned earlier, which redistribute real life resources and practice how we can be in community with each other in a medium that as Adi Kunzmann shows, lends itself to flame wars and toxic conflict. To recognize the potential of these digital environments for generating spiritual fuel and people power is not to glorify the digital over real life. As feminist and anti-racist digital media scholars have long shown, the two are interconnected. There are equal dangers in relying on a digital realm controlled by capital and surveilled by the state and in succumbing to an eco-fascist yearning for more natural states. We need an urban environmental justice that is neither technophobic nor punitive of those taking back public space, where we explore safer ways for leaving the privatized spaces that capitalism has forced us into as visionary cyborgs or as material bodies that engage in the necessary risk of protesting and commingling, where our children grow up loving bats and people and learning to give space as in the interdependent earthlings, where our youth become proficient in taking down drones and white supremacist pages and in growing foods that with, withstand wind and drought. As our pasts and our present remind us, our methods can be as queer as our dreams. They can be both safe and promiscuous. So, thank you. And the applause for Jim. Thank you, Jen, if you're listening to this right now or at any point for providing us with this input. Um, I want to give a little bit of a framework that Jen had for this and maybe before even the framework, just say a few words about abolition because I think in the German context, it's a really underrepresented uh, demand and movement. It's more than just a demand. It's uh, how we think society. Uh, abolition is the or abolitionist movements are movements that are concerned about uh, 
abolishing all forms of slavery in its current articulations that doesn't always refer to the plantation slavery, the unfree labor that happened in the United States. It is uh, their global perspectives on abolition and abolitionist movements right now also look on the police and reminded us that the, poli the problem is not police violence, the problem is an institution like the police itself and give us really radical perspectives on how to think the world and how to think securely where we move our resources to. We maybe heard, for those of you who joined the global protests uh, in the within the movement for Black Lives or Black Lives Matter, have heard the term abolish the police or defund the police, that means to take resources out of the apparatus that is state sanctioning folks, especially queer, trans of color folks, especially folks with not the right passport, um, and want to take these resources and have social solutions for social problems. So care, not cops, ultimately. I'm sorry for all my fellow abolitionists if I butchered this introduction, short introduction of abolition. I just thought it was important to say a few words in this. Jin wrote this and, and, and spoke this piece um, in a time where the neoliberal carceral institutions, so like the police, like border regimes, like also parts of the psychiatry, psychiatries that we see are failing and it creates a vacuum. Um, the lockdown itself that at one side is necessary to keep a lot of people alive and to prevent premature death is on the other side, uh, repeating those spatial uh, control of racialized bodies, especially because if there are more police controls, we all know who is going to be controlled and, there, and who is not able to be controlled, who is sanctioned by police, who is brutalized by police, and ultimately also here in Germany all the time dies at the hands of police officers. Abolition uh, is not, uh, as Jen taught us about police brutality, but how we imagine uh, s security and safety. And we also see at the medical sector, when we look at the triage, the triage as a, uh, yeah, how you make a decision when the resources in a hospital are running out to facilitate everybody with the oxygen that's necessary if your lungs are collapsing to decide who is getting the measurements to save the lives and who don't, like what happened uh, famously, not only, but also in Bergamo last year in terms of COVID. And within this triage, disabled people, trans people are by default not a priori, uh, not prioritized in this. So it is a decision of who lives and who dies and premature preventable death. Um, yeah, so thank you so much, Jen, for providing us uh, with this input. And to you, Lilith, I will just want to give you the very open question of what you resonate with, what you want to respond to, to Jen's input, and what you want to give us, share with us in this conversation. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, so as I told you guys that I'm working with uh, uh, refugees and asylum seekers in Germany, the I'm going to talk about the issues that we had in our work related to asylum seekers, especially queer asylum seekers. So as soon as we uh, went into the first lockdown, um, we started getting a lot of messages inside the Germany and not outside of the Germany in the first few weeks um, that people are getting re-traumatized because of this uh, closed space where they cannot go anywhere. Um, after a couple of weeks, we started getting a lot of messages from Iran, and till today, we get a lot of messages from Iran. Last year, around 429 people contacted us from other countries outside of Germany, and 127 from them were just from Iran. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, there was also a young person, Ali Raza Munfarid, he was also decapitated and killed by his own family uh, because he wanted to come to Turkey to meet his boyfriend. Um, that is what we are reaping from uh, this 
uh, lockdown, trying to save the lives, but in saving those lives, we have put the lives of queer people in extreme danger. Um, I remember also uh, there were people who were telling us that they are getting beaten by security guards. Uh, they are having issues uh, because they want to go out and just be themselves. All the meeting points were closed. All the organizations that used to have counseling, they were closed. Then all of a sudden everybody was doing online, online, online. Without even imagining that in an asylum center you do not have Wi-Fi. And most of all, you do not have a safe space as a queer person. If you are going to talk about your issues in your mother tongue, of course in your mother tongue, you're not going to talk about these issues in German. And then you need somebody who is going to interpret that. Where are you going to do it? So the, the, the matter of safe space that we have been yelling for decades and decades and decades to the government that we need safe spaces. All of a sudden, the government realizes we do not have safe spaces anywhere, actually. Violence against children, violence against women, violence against queer bodies, it increased three to four times before pandemic. And people were writing to us every single day. We lately came to a small uh, study that we done with our partner organizations all around Germany. And we have come to the conclusion that during the pandemic and lockdown periods, the physical violence against queer bodies was increased three times before pandemic. And the verbal violence actually 10 times. That's, it's, it was of huge magnitudes. But I would also like to tell people here who are not aware about how asylum seekers and especially people who are queer and asylum seekers have to go through in their daily lives, uh, also with the response to the pandemic. Um, we do not, I'm also a queer person, we do not have families per se. And last year when Angela Merkel and all the Bundes president and they decided, you can go to your families and meet people there for your Christmas. We thought to ourselves, even many German nationals, they were like, do we have families? Do we? And the answer was, not really. And then the people who are on, on, on a, on a uh, flee from their countries, away from their families, we had our own small pockets of families. We provide each other that security, that safety. Queer trans women like me have other queer trans women from South Asia that we hold hands of each other and tell, okay, everything will be all right. We will get through this sooner or later. And then I remember there was like also a, a quote, um, I think Angela Merkel said that or somebody else, I'm forgetting, but that was also, maybe Jacinda was it. We are all in the same boat. I heard this so many times. No, we are in Titanic. I'm sorry. We are not in the same boat. You guys who were fantasizing and romanticizing the lockdowns, uh, living in their huge villas, especially white people, <laughs> now you will calm down, you will go back to yoga classes, you will do your meditation. No, I am sorry to use this word. You privileged assholes, we don't have that. We are confined. We live in confinements. Our bodies are controlled everywhere, regardless of where we are living. Even if people were going out, white people were going out, they were not checked out that much by the police. But if people who were not white and who were not conforming the German standard of being a German, they were controlled by the police as well. Why are you out? Why are you uh, here? What are you doing here? And all these things, they have traumatized us. The, we, we, we were always traumatized by all this bullshit of being living in a binary system, to be honest. There is a man, there is a woman. A woman 
have sex with the man, after she gets married with them, and then they have children. That's it. That's what we still think. Everybody thinks like that. Most of them, I mean, not everybody. We are just a very small population that doesn't think like that because we are not, we don't want to be slaves of this patriarchal system. And then the patriarchy is aided by capitalism and then thanks to the religions that we have nowadays, uh, they also aid them. They're like, yeah, good. We want to have patriarchy. Yes, we want to control the sexuality of people. We want to control their gender identities. And we will do that. We are with you. The Pope said a couple of um, weeks ago, no, we are not going to bless the same-sex marriages. Come on, Pop. I think Jesus was gay. <laughs> Running around with 12 people who are all men and then having the best female friends. Come on. It's a cliche, I know. It's a cliche, but he was not married even when he was 30 plus. What was he doing? And you are saying you're not going to bless the same-sex marriages. The same thing also goes to other people, like people talk about, for example, uh, Uyghur Muslims are living in concentration camps. Um, They're all going through bullshit, but have anybody thought about the queer Uyghur Muslims? I haven't heard about it. Nobody talks about it. And we are so much dependent on China that we do not even want to bring it on the table. Let's talk about these issues. No, we are not going to do that. With Chechnya, concentration camps, they have learned it really good from Germans. Well done. Putting people behind concentration camps and killing them and making them ungay, unqueer. How? I, I, I always come to the conclusion that most of the things, the, most of the issues that we have in today's world, they funnel down to two main things. Religion, capitalism, both assisting patriarchy. Let's come together and sit together on your heads and let's destroy your lives. We don't want people to be happy. We don't want them to live their lives. We want to control them, like tell carrots and sticks all the times. If you're going to be a good Christian, we will bless you. If you're going to be a good Muslim, we will bless you, or whatever the religion you have. And if not, we will kill you. We will rape you. We will try to correct you. And then they forget and they preach God as well. That's where I get also confused. And this is where the problem lies. We think about gods or we think about religions, whatever, that God is almighty. And I always tell people who believe in gods or whatever God they believe in, if God is almighty or the gods are almighty, they are capable of producing queer people. Don't question their capability. They know what they are doing, and they are doing it right. They want to have fun on this planet as well. They don't want us to live boring lives. Sorry, I'm a bit... <laughs> um, because my personal life has been affected by these two systems a lot. Patriarchy coming in relation with capitalism and with uh, religion together. Uh, and whenever I talk to other people, the final conclusion comes there. A man has to dress like that. Who tells us that? Of course. Big outlets. That's how a man should look like. Women, that's how a woman should look like. No, I'm sorry. We are queer people. We will decide what we want to look like. And if we look odd to you, I'm sorry, it's your issue. You do not have seen colors of this nature. Nature is full of colors. Nature is beautiful, and we are part of this nature. And this is also a Eurocentric issue that uh, when I was uh, doing my master's on environment, 
the Eurocentric issue and the white person that brought us this issue that we are not part of the nature, we are outside of the nature. This is what they also brought to us. Like when they came to India, we were worshiping or we were paying our homage actually. We were paying our homage to trees, to rivers, to the nature. And they told us, oh, you have a lot of gods and you're worshiping them. We're like, no, we respect our nature. We respect the natural cycles. They came, they were like, no, we're going to hunt down all your animals. We need ivory. Ah, we need tiger uh, 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 leather. We want to have some stuffed animals. We're going to kill your rhinos. They did it. They started like game. In English, you call it wild game. They're not game. They are part of our system. We need them. And when they left us, back to colonization, they created boundaries between lands, newly created nation states. Nature does not have boundaries. Animals who used to migrate on the land, they cannot migrate anymore. They died. Some of them are at the brink of extinction at the moment. So it's, it's beyond human perspective that the colonizers brought with them. It was like we are the masters of the entire world. At least the indigenous people or the First Nations, they were not treating their nature like that. They were respecting nature. They were respecting queer bodies. They were respecting queerness within the nature. Uh, also, look at the rivers, just simple examples. Europeans have straightened out all the rivers, built dams on them. In nature, a river is never straight. It's always queer, it's meandering, it's making its own ways. But the white man came and told us, no, let's put a dam on it. <laughs> yeah, dam things. Break the flow of nature. That's, that's where it all came from. It's, it's e extremely complex. It's not a simple thing to explain. If you look at different perspective, also legal perspective, where I'm working these days as well, legalities of your bodies. You need to be a legal person to be able to decide what you want. If you're not a legal person in Germany, you can't decide for yourself. It's the other people who will decide for you. So you have made, I'm, I'm saying you, I'm not meaning you guys here. <laughs> I'm like the people, the system, the developers of these systems have made it so bad for us and we think it's normal. It's all part of the God's big plan, maybe. No, it's not his plan. Believe me, if you meet God today, he would be like, what are you doing? <laughs> Is this what I created you for? <laughs> Stop plundering this earth. Stop sabotaging other people. Stop making these boundaries, which I don't have. God doesn't have boundaries if there is a God. It's beyond and above everything. And that's how human beings should be. But in relation and in peace with the environment they live in and with other people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for reminding us who we need to center in these fights. I'm always like, oh yeah, I'm a queer person of color, but oh no, I have my whole box of suitcase of privileges with my passport and being born here and my surname and stuff like this. Um, so yeah, thank you for reminding me and all of us uh, where our focus needs to be in these fights. Um, you mentioned the... Um, the intersection between queer liberation, colonized, colonized implementation of the gender binary, and at the intersections of indigenous 
knowledge when it comes to the planet and the planet Earth. I mean, here when you buy some certain products and they say like, hey, we're going to plant a tree for you. And you think like, oh yeah, that's amazing. Trees are great. And then <laughs> they go somewhere into the, into the global south and put these huge plantations, like this, what you would hear call a forest, of the same trees that are not nurturing the ground, they don't have any relationship to the plants that are growing there, and then you have these big like gardens that are not doing anything for the environment, so it really needs to have this, you really need to have this indigenous knowledge about the soil, about the ground, about what is nurturing, about the cycles and the climate that is uh, always, always, always big part of indigenous movements uh, as the, yeah, politi like green politics, yeah, Fridays for Future didn't invent that. So it's, uh, thank you for reminding us of that as well. There are so many important points I'm uh, thinking about how we can move forward with this conversation. And I think for trying to end before we go into the discussion with uh, all of you folks that are here and listening to this conversation to participate in. Uh, I want to emphasize of how can we move forward in these times and what does it need? And um, what can queer BIPOC perspectives contribute to a liberation, not only of queer BIPOCs, but of all of humans? I, I strongly believe that in authentic relationships, that being in authentic relationship with each other as uh, Jen has quoted also, or um, not exactly cited, but referred to Adrian Marie Brown. Um, there is something to gain for everybody. It's not just like, okay, all the privileged people have to, to throw everything away. It's also you gain so much from queer liberation, from queer of color liberation, from thinking a world differently than imagining nation states and the, const uh, and the construction of um, citizenship we need a world beyond citizenship to live in a free world. Um, for this, I want to introduce the video of Silesh Naidu um, in a second. Uh, that being said, this video has come spontaneously and Silesh decided to give their voice to a queer Palestinian to talk about uh, queerness and fight for liberation from a perspective that wasn't represented originally here on the podium. And I'm sure everybody here has all kinds of thoughts, all kinds of analyses about this topic, about the conflict that's going on in Western, uh, Western Asia or from where we are right now, uh, the Middle East, uh, now Austin. Um, I think this video and these perspectives are very nurturing in the terms of what they give us, how we can think queer liberation um, from a marginalized perspective. And um, we'll say a few more words to the video after it has been played. Um, so for now also, if you're watching right now or at some point, Silish, thank you so much for the video you have provided. Since it was yesterday, I'm so sorry for the person that cannot remember the name right now because I've watched it once this morning and I didn't really have time to include this in my preparation. But in advance, thank you for, for your perspectives and um, we'll hear a few words afterwards. Um, sorry, before that, I want to introduce Silish really quickly. Silish Naidu is a poet and filmmaker based in Berlin, a former chanc German chancellor's fellow uh, they have worked in the field of migration, education, and gender for over a decade, with their projects winning the acclaim of the New York Times, Zeit Online, and also being exhibited in the Goethe Institute in Mumbai. Hi, I'm Silas Naidu. I'm an artist, researcher, and writer based in Berlin. I'd like to thank the community of organizers in Freiburg for allowing me to participate digitally and to speak any of my thoughts, honestly. Uh, to the public. I'm greatly honored that I was invited. I'm sad that I can't be there with you in Freiburg. Um, I had some personal emergencies come up, but I'm excited about this opportunity to participate digitally. I would also like to uh, introduce you to my friend Najwa. Hi, I'm Najwa Ahmed. I'm a Palestinian artist, queer artist and writer living in Berlin. And thank you, Salish, for inviting me for this. I would like also to talk about the context of why am I here. 
which is what happened at Freiburg from the, the funders, if that's okay for you. Yeah, go for it. Because I was motivated to come after hearing that <clears throat> the funders of uh, the, the, com the convention of what's happening in Freiburg was taken uh, away because Palestina Speaks or Palestine Speaks was invited. Um, so I said, then they want to silence Palestinian voices and that's why I'm here. Yes. Yeah, I think for me, the purpose I was invited to this conference was to speak about queerness in the context of decoloniality. And I think it's an interesting intersection for to believe that queerness is fundamentally a decolonial struggle. And to see how the effects of colonialism are still having impacts today, particularly in the ongoing suppression of Palestinian people's rights across the world. It's important to bring these voices uh, to the surface. And I get opportunities to speak all the time, but I think it's also important to highlight voices that don't get opportunities to speak all the time because they're silenced by political, economic, and social resistance. So, Najwa, I just actually have some questions for you that I'd like to highlight. Uh, particularly, like, what is, what is your perspective on queerness within the Palestinian struggle? Well, there is first, what is the perspective of only just being a Palestinian to begin with? Yeah. And there is on top of that. Uh, to be a Palestinian in the the colonial situation that we're living in is already very complex and very different and um, like different from the historical even background of what we lived under the mandates and but also being queer so you have many layers of discrimination against you and you have to lay low but you still have this connection with the people and with the land that you have to fight for so there is an internal conflict of being a queer and being a Palestinian you want to fight for the cause that is greater than you and that you believe in, but you also have your personal cause that the majority of people there do not support you with. Sometimes people feel frustrated and sad and, and hurt, so they leave and they just let go or drop that cause, the main cause, which is Palestine, and the fight against oppression and apartheid and the fight for freedom. But you, just at one point, you can't. You can't because it's just basic human decency. Even if you're not a Palestinian, even if you don't associate with that struggle and with the history, you still feel that human side of you wanting to do something for the right thing, you know, for the right cause. So after some time, I even like personally had this internal conflict at one point where like my people wouldn't necessarily um, accept the way I choose to live my life. But at one point, I was like, who even cares? Like, my queerness is on the side when there is this, the people are being oppressed, children are being killed, activists are being put in prison without any justification. So I put all my personal needs and issues on the side and I try to do something for my people. And then when we are free and independent, then we can disagree or have conversations about our choices and yeah. our orientation or our differences. Yeah. And it's interesting... It's interesting that you bring up that, that there has to be this detachment between how you can live your life as a queer person, but also how you can fight for resistance at the same time. Um, and I'm interested, how do, you, how, do you, like, how do you resolve that within yourself? Like, how do you find that motivation to continue the struggle, but also feeling like there's a distance to it in the way you want to live your life? It's not easy. As I said, when the situation is a bit stable, I, I get some time to think about it. Yeah. So I reflect and I feel like, okay, I need to detach from, and I'm talking personally, maybe there are other queer Palestinian um, artists or activists who found a different way. Yeah. But for me, I only find that time when it's a bit stable back home and yeah. I can like, okay, now I can go back to myself and um, deconstruct what, I, what issues I have or work on my things. But then when the situation is really intense as what's yeah. happening now in, in the whole of Palestine, is I just, the only option I have yeah. is to put my personal things on yeah. the side and focus on working with like with yeah. the movement. But something you had mentioned earlier when we were speaking, it's also how queer people are mobilizing in the streets within Palestine yeah. to continue the struggle and to fight the struggle. And can you talk more about that? Yeah, it's for the first time, uh, for the last 73 years, I've seen, uh, maybe also because I'm more in touch with queer Palestinian activists and, and artists in Palestine, and I see that they are, uh, of course, many of them are still undercover and underground, but uh, there is this movement, like they are participating more. They are motivated to be part of that movement. I think maybe because for the first time also in 73 years, it's in the whole of Palestine, in yeah. the whole of the land, in the occupied 
territory, the 48 in the West Bank, in Gaza, and also worldwide, all Palestinians are joining yeah. forces. So the queers thought, I think, uh, and I heard from them that this is the time where we also want to be part of the huge populist movement. It's not about politics anymore. It's about people asking for their basic rights. And we know also as queers and as different people, we know that if it wasn't for the occupation and the oppression that we've been facing for the last 73 years, our societies would have been different. Definitely, Very much so. Definitely. Yeah. Because the, the, the colonial structure that we are put under and that we're, we're facing those, they, they keep pushing you down. They keep putting yeah. you in a position that you cannot uh, progress. You yeah. cannot develop. You cannot reflect. Yeah. So all you think about is your survival. Yeah. And that's why we kind of give a slack to our people saying, it could have been better because we know that they are good people. Yeah. To see things from a different perspective, from our perspective, if they were not facing that yeah. injustice on a daily basis and that fear and that uh, dehumanization by yeah. the occupation. Which is interesting to think about because queerness in the West is propaganda. It's a propaganda around sexual identity. It perpetuates the state of Israel around the sort of pinkwashing that Israel is this bastion of freedom because they have queerness. But fundamentally, queerness was a colonial construct that these identities of being queer and having multiple genders or sexual uh, sexualities like gender is a colonial construct. All these constructs were imposed upon us. And so the opposition of resistance that you bring up that has nothing to do with, you know, how we can live our lives or how can you express yourself gender wise or sexually. Rather, it's rooted in decoloniality that on, in order to get to this place where you can fundamentally have these expressions resurface, you actually need to decolonize. And it's interesting that you bring up this process is happening in Palestine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because we do know, like, we we are we didn't grow up in, in the West to be brainwashed by that propaganda and that trend. We know what is what we need. It's not about the, just the sexual orientation or the sexual uh, needs. It's a more about against, uh, fighting against the oppression and fighting against that structure. So when we come here and we see how it's like it's practiced, for me it was disappointing because I thought that queers within the West would be really more open to changing things and to difference and to more tolerant. And I thought I, I just realized they are even more stuck in right. the machine. So we go back to the roots of okay, we have issues to work on, and it's even more complex and nuanced than just asexual orientation yeah but when you mentioned that i just uh, i i cannot help but think about the double standards that the west uh, propaganda about queerness is it, like double standards so if you are it's uh, if it's just about sexual orientation and desires then yeah please take your freedom and practice it but if i am queer and also at the same time an activist and fighting against injustices especially something like an occupation like israel then Oh no, stop, you cannot do that. Right. So so what is liberation for you? Is it just sexual liberation? Then And if it's just sexual liberation, which means you're like you're fighting against a very specific type, a Victorian Christianized mm. co like coloniality. You know, and other religions have different modalities of sexual ag gender oppression, but like the global brand was Christianity. Mm. The global brand that has taken hold in all the colonies was Christianity. And fundamentally that we are not trying to decolonize ourselves from that because it was never our identity to begin with. For me, it's about like, how are we resurfacing and reconnecting to mm -hmm. who we originally were, were before these colon colonial ideas were imposed upon yeah. us, before mm -hmm. we uh, had to internalize this as parts of who we are. And that's why I believe like queerness is also a, a fundamentally a resistance movement. Mm -hmm. It's how are we resisting what is happening in the status quo to dream and think of something better yeah and i think that's something that's really connects to the palestinian struggle because it is constant a struggle for a dream of something better mm -hmm. and even if it's not just like a, a, a struggle or um, a fight for um for freedom from that oppression or the occupation there is the the whole area has been colonized for centuries and it's still like as yeah. they, they talk about post-colonial this and post-colonial that but it's not post-colonial well yes. the entire world is not post-colonial <laughs> right? yeah, i mean look at every global trade agreement and military occupation and you know when you mentioned the how we how those um ideas and rules came yeah so all of 
the rules that we have uh, in, for example, in the Palestinian and Jordanian um, uh, law system, they are all coming from the British mandate. So even when they punish like a queer person, gay or lesbian or any of the punishment rules are all coming from the British mandate. So mm-hmm. they are not even from our original. Mm. And that we're still practicing it and thinking that it's our own law. Yeah. But it's just being updated for the, since 1912. It's just being updated, but it's the same thing. It's yeah. Basic. And these modalities of oppression are being updated to reimpose colonial rule under a system of globalized capitalism, yeah. right? Like Israel is an entity of globalized capitalism. It is a military foothold in the Middle East for globalized capitalism, you know, and it comes at the expense of the Palestinian people. And we forget that it's not just about like, and Israel's right to exist. It's like, who gave this mandate and for what reason? And who gave them the right to exist? And who gave the people who gave the mandate the right to give that mandate? <laughs> you know, like, who put you in charge? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's the British who yes. did, of course. They just took the land and gave it to them as a gift, and people were there living there for centuries. Yes. It's like, okay, we thought that it's empty, so here's a piece of land. Yes. Oops, no, there are people living there. Okay, too late. We cannot fix it. <laughs> Najwa, sure. we have a couple of minutes late left, but you have a performance at Zekau coming up tomorrow. Can yeah. you tell the people in Freiburg a little bit about your performance that you're doing? Yeah, so I cannot tell a lot about it because the, the performance is like uh, based on secrecy and metaphorism and symbolism because I cannot tell too much since it is again a white structure that we're performing inside and if they know the real intentions of what this we're is going to air bef- like after your performance okay, okay. Yeah. so um, our performance is about the watermelon resistance uh, the resistance the, the symbolism of the watermelons is not just about the colors which are the colors of the Palestinian flag but it's also about the confiscation of the land that is the richest uh, lands in Palestine that farmers grow uh, melons, watermelons. So Israel started taking that land after they discovered that it's really rich in minerals. So that's another level of watermelons as a symbol of Palestinian resistance besides the um, the oranges. And we are doing this performance where we will be actually kind of metaphorically raising the Palestinian flag within this white structure, putting watermelon slices on the fences and um, I will be performing uh, in white as white because it is also a part of the Palestinian flag color, but it's a symbol of surrender. And I will be performing surrender while actually performing and acting the uh, resistance and the resilience while putting the watermelons on the fence. So giving the audiences the feeling that I'm surrendering, but while I'm doing it, what I'm doing is actually just resisting. That's absolutely beautiful. One more question. Can I eat the watermelon after? Uh, we will save you so. Okay, thank you. Uh, anyway, thank you everyone in Freiburg for participating in this conversation and coming to this panel. And thank you for the organizers for having us. Uh, I hope to come soon and I appreciate you giving us your time. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, before we... Uh, I have just two things to say, if it's okay for you. Um, Have anybody ever thought about why we don't question the occupation of Israel? Any guesses? Why we, so you want to talk about Israel as an occupant? I yeah, uh, Israel is there. Israel is existing, but nobody wants to say that it has occupied land. And I think to bridge this conversation to what happened here in this conversation, it's also like they have been talking about the British mandate and that the Palestinian right of having a country has been rejected long before the state of Israel. Exactly. There are, yeah, that it's early. Like I think it was 1902 or 1912 when the British said. Palestinians should never have uh, their own country, yeah. but also like want to highlight from a post-colonial perspective and from this perspective of colonization. Of course, there's uh, they they also frame this has been a colonized area for way longer than what is talked about right now, way longer, and that the state of uh, when in post-colonial theory the state of uh, Haiti and their constitution is a 
protection for all black people to come there, for enslaved people to come there, which is a really important thing. The, the, the major difference, like for a colonial state also, is that the, uh, Israel can be seen as a protection space yes. for, for yes. Jewish yes. people. Well, just like, yeah, that's one part of the conversation I want to like add to, and that's like one part of the difference. Um, I didn't want to dive too deep into it, but I wanted to let you finish yeah, but, too. But I, I always, think about it, and that's my personal thought. If you're going to question about the occupation of any place, regardless of uh, just Israel, then the indigenous people will claim right in Canada, in the United States of America, in Australia, in New Zealand, in Beijing, uh, where else? In South Africa, that have we, we seen that. Uh, it's still not the best, but it's still working. And then also, most of the South America and Latin American countries. So, the, the bigger players on the scene, they don't want to question that, because then Russia will also have to uh, tell that they are also uh, interfering in so many countries. Uh, Great Britain will ha also have to uh, put themselves uh, forward and have to ask for forgiveness and also reparations they have to pay to a lot of countries. And then Spain will have to do that as well. France will have to do that as well. So all of it, it's, it's still a colonial thing that's still going on. And to make things worse, uh, in this part, it's been done against a community uh, the Jewish community, which has faced anti-Semitism in Europe in the last couple of centuries. Uh, we know even in Germany, uh, when it was the Pope's best place to choose a Reich and Kaiser and all of that, uh, they were killed here. Black Plague was because of Jews. So anti-Semitism and then that resulting with the colonial, uh, col colonial uh, perspective, it has aggravated and accelerated the, all the issues in that area. And I think we would have had a very good uh, results of it uh, if the colonizers didn't have done that much harm to the area beforehand. Thank That's you what for, I think. Thank you for highlighting that uh, the roots of this conflict go, yeah. <laughs> so much to understand the perspective of post-colonialism. We cannot only look at the past decades, but we need to look at the past centuries, as you just said, and the implementation. And I think um, one thing that they both highlighted in this uh, talk is the Western propaganda of queerness right now, and that the yeah, queerness is a white thing now, and everybody's waving rainbow flags, and people want to use different pronouns these days, and, as if this was uh, something completely new that the West invented and the rest of the world needs to have still. And like an, from uh, a Filipino perspective, which I mean, the Philippines are 7,000 island, over 7,000 islands that would have never said, hey, where are the Philippines before the colonizers came? But also when Magellan came to the Philippines and wanted to colonize this place, Lapu-Lapu, who we would now call a genderqueer person, probably uh, there were different words and Tagalog you would say bakla, uh, and the army fought against this colonization and they actually went away only for 30 years and then they came back and, and did the thing, but colonial uh, resistance against colonial powers, against colonization, against not only the gender binary, but as we learned just now uh, from uh, for the concept of gender itself, the concept of sexuality itself, uh, the resistance against that has been a queer one from, from day one. From day one, queer perspectives were always on the forefront of fighting colonialism. These stories are just way harder to find than the dominant narrative of uh, what pride is framed here as now. As I said before, we're in uh, Pride Month. This month is June. I made a promise that I didn't keep. Um, I want you to just take a breath and see how you're sitting and how this is different to the beginning maybe. 
not necessarily need to change much, but just like check in on yourself, see if you need an anchor, maybe look like how your lower back is feeling or uh, how you're breathing. Okay, and I also forgot to uh, thank not only Silesh but Najwa for this, for this input and for these very important thoughts if we're thinking colonialism, uh, the intersection of colonialism, queerness, uh, nation states, resistance, creativity, art. Um, yeah, thank you for these very important thoughts. There's uh, one last thing I want to, dis to, to talk to you about before I open this conversation to everybody, um, which is the concept that Najwa was talking at, at one point as like a person who is marginalized on multiple axes, um, that they said, sometimes I need to take part of myself back or to, you know, to. to I don't know what the exact word was to take my part of self of my part of myself back to be able to take to to fight you know to struggle to maybe uh, I don't know if they meant it this way uh, haven't yeah uh, don't know if th this is exactly the context but as I see it is also like okay sometimes when I go into community to fight with I cannot always put my queerness and my, my uh, identity and a lot of struggles who are part of me and who I am into that fight because I know, okay, I need to take a step back with that first to get along with people and to, you know, struggle for, for liberation on, on, in different ways. Uh, what do you think about that, like having to take a step back? Would you agree or wh what is your take on kind of making, you know, parts of your identity not as visible or not as... Uh, important or um, compromising on this? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, it depends on the context most of the time. Like I don't uh, have to put my womanhood all the time in front. I don't have to put my queerness all the time in front of uh, a fight or my migration background or non-German citizenship, all these things. It depends what the fight is about, if it's more about liberating yourself from different uh, types of slavery. And please don't forget we are still living in that kind of era. Uh, many people think that we are free. No, we have contracts these days. You're still not free. Um, and then we have a number. Uh, we call it rent and versicherung. But anyways, uh, it's how you get a tag, uh, like the cows and the pigs get in their ears. They're also tagged, and they're also managed. And literally, uh, from day one to till they are on the plate, they are given that number. Um, so I think, it, back to your question, all of these tags and all of these uh, identities that one person carries, you don't always have to push them to the front. Be generous to yourself, it's very important, extremely important. Take time for yourself, uh, try to relax in the evening if you can. Uh, meet your friends, they are very important people around you, they are really very, very important. Um, the pandemic has also shown us uh, that we need people as queer people, as queer persons. And try to be more focused on how you can live a good life with other people. That's, that's how it should be from day one. Uh, when I came to Germany, that I used to hear one sentence very often, das geht mich nicht an. 
And I used to think, wow, <laughs> that's the peak of individualism. Um, yeah, be an individual, but uh, it's not about das geht mich nicht an. Of course it does. At the end of the day, you are also part of the ecosystem. It does affect you. And someday or back, it will come back and bite you. That's how uh, we used to learn in our part of the world. We have a word called karma, which has become like international. Um, so we call it karma chakar, the circle of the karma. It comes back. What goes around comes back, comes around. So always be positive towards people. Tell them that they are looking good. Tell them that they are wearing nice clothes. Tell them that they are pretty, they are beautiful. Just be nice to fellow human beings. And if we cannot uh, do that after this uh, more than a year of pandemic, then I think we deserve worse than pandemic. It was just nothing. So yeah, and just try to be as genuine as you are. Be yourself. Uh, stay with positive people, stay around with positive people, and fight for everyone. At the end of the day, we are all human beings, and it doesn't matter what we have. Do we have boobs or penis? Do we have a vagina? Uh, we have short hair, long hair, it doesn't matter. Which skin color, that, that's also something, it's, uh, I don't get it. Skin color, it's, it's beautiful. From people who are redhead, up to until people who are totally uh, filled with melanin, it's all beautiful. It's a spectrum. If you see garden, I remember there was, um, I don't remember which person was that, uh, they said that uh, if you go to a garden and if you see only white roses, you won't like it. And if you go to a garden that has all colors, all types of flowers, you will love it. So we are also part of this human garden. And we are going to be like one, which people have also done, actually. If you see broiler chickens, they are all white. If you see the pigs that we eat, they are all white. If you look at the milk-producing cows, they are black and white. So uh, I don't know what's the... Why, why colonizers wanted to have everything homogenous and then be against homosexuality. Like, homo should be there with the genus, but not with the sexuality. I, I don't get that. Like, there are so many conflicting things that have been done by colonizers. Like, at one end, they wanted uh, to be masters and control everything. It's easy to control when you are homogenized. Then it's definitely easy. And it's hard to control when you are uh, colorful, beautiful, with different perspectives. Uh, they can't control you then. That's why they are afraid of you. Other than that, I don't think there is anything to be afraid of being queer or being different. Thank you. And to give a uh, few thoughts, um, I, w I would love to hear that from uh, Jin as well as Silish and Najwa as well as from you, unfortunately. The others are not possible, but why do we need queer liberation, queer of color liberation, uh, in order to create a better world? Like, what can all the others that are not positioned as queer BIPOC, who don't necessarily have yet such a post-colonial perspective, what can they win from, from, from like your liberation? Um, I will, maybe it's a repetition, but look, we believe that that's also a post-colonial thing and that's also coming from a very Eurocentric uh, perspective. Oh, we colonized everybody and we destroyed them. And now uh, I'm talking about the persons who feel bad for us. Now we have to correct it and now we have to make it uh, up to them. No, my dear fellow human beings, uh, look at yourself as well. Uh, you're following uh, things which are being 
taught to you that they should be like that? Should they be? And the question that you posed, by having that queer liberation, I think you will go back to your roots. You will understand yourself more. You will understand about the humanity in general more. Because even now you are told, oh, there are Egyptians. No, there are people living in Egypt. Oh, they are Indians. No, there are people living in India. Oh, they are Russians from Kamchatka up till Moscow. My God, if you look at their diversity, they are not Russians, they are living in Russia. The same is true also for Germany. Forget about it that you are Germans. It's a country, it's the name of a country. It's not your identity. You are living in this country, I'm living in this country. It's not going to make you Germans. You are German citizens. So when you will go back to your roots, you will understand that at the end of the day, it's that human perspective that is connecting us all. The only difference that I used to have when I came to this country was the language. That's it. Otherwise, I also eat the same things that you guys eat. Maybe even more. I love German food. <laughs> Sorry, I'm confessing. <laughs> Many people don't. Um, th that, that was it. I, I, that was the only thing that I could not read your thoughts because you were speaking your thoughts in a language that I could not understand. But when I understood the language, uh, we have same kind of thoughts. We think similar. Uh, our brain cells work uh, very much the same way as yours. My skin also get burned in the sun. It's not that it doesn't. I also have thirst, I also have hunger. So all these human factors will come on the top rather than looking at each other in different boxes. Yeah, she must be a lesbian, it doesn't matter. If she is, she will tell you, or if she wants to. Or maybe that person is trans. Oh, if they want to, they will tell you. Maybe they don't want that label of trans on them. That's also something coming from a very Eurocentric perspective. Or these people who do not conform to the both genders, they are trans. Those who are not born with the same genitals, they are inter. Uh, uh, sorry, we are all humans. So that will help us, and that will help us to reflect on our strengths and on our weaknesses. And I think this liberation, I hope I live to see it, uh, because sometimes I really get afraid that uh, there are still powers who are now backlashing, and they don't want us to be uh, humans again, because they are afraid, they want to control again. They want you to be man and woman and have a family. That's it. Uh, don't go outside of these two boxes. Uh, and women, you need to produce children. That's your basic function, like a cow. No, never. That's something that you are capable of. If you want to, well and good. If you don't, you don't have to. But they tell you all the time, all the media, you need to have a family, you need to have a boyfriend, you need to have a girlfriend. Come on. Life is much more and beyond that. You need loving people around you. You need people who take care of you. They can be your best friends. And physical needs can be also fulfilled by your best friends. That's also something we, we don't break the taboos within the community. If I, <laughs> if I start opening my mouth, I think <laughs> that would be way too much. Anyways, we are giving a signal that the time is almost up. Thank you. Thank you everybody for listening for so long. We will open the question for the, uh, for the panel just now. I want to everybody... Uh,
That's all good. Thank you for letting us know. Uh, okay, we have five minutes. We will postpone the applause to the end because we're kind of in a hurry. Uh, does anybody have any questions for the panel? Either we spoke too good or too bad. Oh, there's a question in the back, I think. Thank you so much for this question. I will repeat it through the microphone as I understood it uh, so everybody can hear it and the people that are watching the stream as well. Uh, the question was uh, that there is criticism of uh, the notion that looking into the past to decolonize queerness and gender is looking not in the, into the future enough and is sticking to concepts that might not be useful if I understood the question right. Thank you for that. Do you want to start? I have also thoughts towards it. Mm, yeah. I can, if it's okay for you. Um, um, it's, I think it's a grievance that comes out because there were uh, people, there were queer people who were already struggling in those areas. The struggle was there. It's not that we were living under a queer regime. No, we were not. But our struggles were pushed back to hundreds of years that we have had achieved in those times as the colonization became. Looking at that perspective, looking at those struggles and learning from those struggles and applying them in future is what it should be done. It's not about that we are romanticizing the past. It's more about we have that grievance that the past could not become the future. Rather, it was sent back to hundreds and hundreds of years uh, that we couldn't actually progress on it. Still, it's the same thing. The transgender community in uh, South Asia, it was criminalized by the British, and we were called a different tribe of people. We were not a tribe, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, so all these kind of things, I think uh, it, it's understood differently because it's once again coming from a white lens, sorry to say, from a very Eurocentric perspective. And they forget about it that uh, it's not about uh, uh, that we are going to go into the past and then we are going to wear all the jewels and crowns that the queen took from us. Um, no, we are going to go forward, but with the perspective that there were indigenous queer struggles all around the world that was still happening when we were colonized. Thank you for this, and I think it's a valid question because, of course, there is sometimes also in my head the romanticization of like pre-colonial times and oh my god there there were struggles there there were power structures there they look differently definitely uh every time i'm at the dentist i'm very happy for uh that my tooth is not just getting ripped out there's a lot of like things i'm happy that people have more possibilities right now in terms of how we think but i think like looking into the past and acknowledging a certain lineage within queer liberation fights is also acknowledging that these fights, I'm not the first one fighting them, we're not the first ones fighting them. We uh, can learn from the past. These past are abolitionist past. These past have always uh, encountered 
uh, colonization, so also resistance. And of course, I don't want to go back 500 years. I want to see what's there, what's, what can grow, what seeds were planted there that I can connect to, to, yeah, to liberate the folks I love, to liberate myself, and ultimately, hopefully, to do a small step in my lifetime to liberate, to contribute to liberation to everybody. So, like, baby steps, but I need to know where I come from, I need to know who I will learn of, which stories I look at, to have role models, and to be able to articulate and find a language for, for my struggles. I think that's it. Thank you, that's all good, thank you. Okay, uh, again, uh, thank you, Silas and Najwa. Thank you so much, Jin, the three of you who cannot be here for these thoughts, for these inputs, for, for making me think and re uh, question myself. Thank you, Lilith, so much for having this conversation with me, sharing your thoughts and uh, reminding me who I need to censor, who I need to look at in my work and uh, the powerful work you're doing, the perspectives you are bringing. You're always like on podiums sharing this with the world and this knowledge is really, uh, in German you say unbezahlbar. Uh, it's, yeah, thank you so much. A big applause for Lilith, please. Uh, let's also thank all of you. Thank you for the technicians. Thank you for the people who accompanied us behind the stage. Thank you for listening to us, for making these thoughts, maybe seeds that will grow one day uh, for the whole. There's so many things I'm probably forgetting right now because building an event like this is, uh, I cannot even fathom how, how, how much this takes. So really, thank you. I appreciate all of you a lot. Thanks.